So I'd like to welcome each of our speakers back onto the screen to take part in our panel session. So that'd be James, Alex, and Trevor, Clive and Tim, and Warren. So yeah, this section, uh, session will take about uh, 15 to 20 minutes or so. Viewers, if you haven't already, please uh, ask your questions using the Q&A button and we'll get to as many as we can. Just a reminder that our buy side investor fireside chat is coming up next. So I'm going to uh, kick it off uh, with an ESG question. And I asked this question this morning during the Athabasca One sessions. Uh, so I ask it again, you know, ESG, such an important consideration for junior stocks in the Athabasca Basin, uh, namely the, the Clearwater River Din Nation showed concern last year that so many uranium companies were coming into the, uh, in, either crossing their traditional lands or coming onto their traditional lands, at least in the Western Athabasca. Uh, where they are. So um, the question I pose is how do your teams really approach social license and community consultation? So uh, what I'd be happy to jump in on yeah. that. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, we've, we're working really closely with CRDN. Um, we've addressed a lot of concerns. We're working with Chief Teddy Clark and the others to, uh, to be co good corporate uh, responsible citizens. And um, one, you know, a couple of our drill programs over the last couple of years have have ended early um, and we could have stretched them. We could have stretched them, um, but the last thing you wanna do is, is dunk a, a rig into a water supply or have, a, have, a, you know, have, a, have an issue. Um, and so we've taken that fairly seriously. Um, it's not a perfect process. There's always some challenges, but uh, we met recently with CRDN and, and um, had a really good uh, a conference here in Vancouver with them. And, and so, you know, it's a priority for us and it's, and, and really um, it's, it's, it's part of what we do now in the basin and, and, and uh, just being on top of it and being cognizant and, and, and listening. It's really important. Mm -hmm. Warren, you've worked in that uh, area as well, correct? Yeah, on the Northern Rim, um, we are working with the Athenene Land Resource Office We've had an engagement agreement with them. It, it goes project by project. Uh, there's an analysis that they do on our project to look for any culturally significant areas. Once those are identified, uh, if they coincide with where we want to work, then buffer zones are known and created and we avoid certain areas. Uh, so far that hasn't really been an issue, uh, but we will be, we're always watchful of, of what comes to us from the FNNA. There's three uh, communities or First Nations represented by them in our area in, on the north. So that's um, Fond du Lac First Nation, Black Lake First Nation, and Hatchet Lake. And I think uh, I heard about Hatchet Lake earlier. And so that's that's where the umbrella of the FNNA is. And, and these First Nations have signed uh, agreements with the FNNA to be represented by the YNLR, as we say for short. And uh, we have a good relationship with them. Uh, it's always helpful to have uh, an intermediary that you can send things to, and then they meet the First Nations first, and then we have engagement meetings with First Nations one-on-one, -on -one, so to speak, in, in this new era of Zoom. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, James, how, how, how's your experience working with social license? Uh, likewise, it, it, it has been really good for the better, better part of things. Uh, we've got six different First Nation communities, uh, First Nation and Métis, so Indigenous communities that we're dealing with for our projects. Uh, we've been very open. We've always engaged the communities prior to doing any exploration work. We did have one hiccup with, with one of the communities, just if was more of a proximity thing, but we have reestablished communications and, and things are looking good there. Now with the the new council that they have voted in it's it's in their their hands right now to see where they want to move forward but from calls that we've had earlier this year is that they would like us to to continue moving forward with them and that's what uh, what we plan to do for sure but even with all of the other communities and all the other projects again we've you know we've always been out there talk to them first uh, for example english river first nation have told us on the catharsis project that they have their annual their, their annual retreat uh, between the months of, well, for the whole month of September. So we've made it a, a fact on our end that we don't go up there and do any exploration at all between mid-August to mid-October. So just, yeah, establishing the 
communications and and being very cognizant of of what's going on up north okay great thank you and uh clive tim what, what can you add to this well david to date uh tim and i haven't had any direct contact with any of the aboriginal peoples in our area um that being said our land vendor has been in ongoing negotiations and uh, kept the the bands in the area um, well informed. And um, while Tim and I haven't had any direct experience with these particular bands, Tim and I have had a lot of experience dealing with other uh, bands in different geographic areas in relation to other companies that we're involved in. And as James pointed out, you know, quite often really, um, as long as the lines of communication are kept open and these people do not feel like they've been overlooked or cast aside, um, our experience is that, um, it seems to be the experience of the others on the panel, that, um, you know, they're quite easy to work with. And uh, it's our intention to keep them well informed of what it is we're doing as we move forward and um, make every effort we can to keep them informed and engaged. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you, you said your company is right now one project uh, company. Do you plan to stake or acquire any other projects in the basin? Uh, we're looking in a variety of other areas. Um, we're not looking at staking anything in the basin at this point or acquiring anything in the basin at this point. Okay, can you, uh, I guess, let the, uh, let the word slip where you might look uh, for other projects? And I'm assuming they're uranium. Uh, oh, for sure. Absolutely. Uranium. Um, uh, because we're in the process of staking, David, I really don't want to talk about the geographic areas we're, we're working in, to be honest with you. Okay. But outside of Saskatchewan. Outside of Saskatchewan. Yes. Right. Outside of Canada. Okay. Fair enough. So, um, I guess here comes the question, you know, why work in the Athabasca Basin? You know, what uh, characteristics do your projects share with some of the big deposits? Uh, and, and how do we go about finding another monster deposit in the basin? And I think, you know, maybe James, we start with you here, you know, because you, you, you go to great lengths to educate people on the geology and the exploration techniques. So, you know, how, how do you find another monster in the basin? You drill. You look to find the monster in the basin is you have to go into the basin. But as our approach is, you don't need the monster anymore. You didn't need the monster in the past. You don't need it in the future. Unless you're in that sandstone, then you need the monster. And to be very honest, you probably have a better chance of finding a unicorn downtown Toronto than you do finding the monster in the Athabasca. So it's you know it's really again, goes back to the whole economic standpoint of things is what's going to turn into a mine. Yeah. The monster will not without issues. And how deep, how deep are you going to go nowadays? So why not, why not step back and look outside? Just yeah. okay. seems to be a little bit easier. Okay. So maybe let's elaborate a little bit on the Accio discovery. You know, the, as the mineralization shallows, it does seem to be going from basement rocks to, to sandstone hosted. Is that uh, correct? Maybe in a, at the unconformity. Is that? Nope. Not at all, actually. The, within, the, within the basement rocks. It's all within the basement rocks. The, the sandstone is actually east of where our mineralization is, and our mineralization is at a higher level than where the sandstone is. So it's kind of throwing me for a loop as well. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. But based on based on some of the some of the evidence that we've seen, uh, clay alteration in the drill core, and even some of the sandstone geochem that we're coming that that we're getting back, it looks like there's some some potential within the the Athabasca still for unconformity mineralization. Okay. Okay. Oh, sounds good. Um, Trevor and, and Alex, you know, the, the East Preston drilling last year cut short due to weather. I think everybody yeah. was across the basin. Uh, yeah. This year, you're, you have essentially technical success identifying the right structures, anomalous mineralization, some alteration. Is, is there much you can do uh, this summer or must you wait till next winter before it can get, uh, get going again? And, and what yeah. are you planning to target once you do Get going yeah, in. no, there's probably not a lot we can do that's really going to move the needle A in this market and B uh, during the summer. Um, but uh, Trevor can elaborate a little bit about how we're going to we're going to utilize some methodologies to, to continue on on targeting. Um, but you know, we, we kind of know where we're going, particularly East Preston. 
and and Hatchet has uh, has bona fide targets. Um, it's drill ready. Uh, but Trevor, you, you might want to uh, jump in there. We're at the we're at the point now with East Preston where really the best tool we have in our arsenal is drilling. We've identified the structures, we've identified the alteration, and now we just have to drill and chase them. And uh, you get to that point where that's still your best your best tool because that is the only real truth. Everything else is just giving you a picture of what may or may not be there yeah. until you actually drill it. So, so, I mean, we could go in there and do some work this summer, but really that would just be evaluating targets for future drill programs. But um, our emphasis this summer and fall will be on our Hatchet Lake project with the intention to get back in drilling at East Preston in the winter. Yeah, no, and, and it's, it's important that, you know, the biggest issue that we really have in the market right now is, is investor patience, which is at zero. So, um, you know, everybody wants everything done yesterday and, and it, some companies, uh, and they know who they are, will get early majority of the rest of us, you know, it's, it's, it takes time. You got to put some meters in the ground and it's not like we have a small target zone. We have kilometers of, of target zones here. And it, Trevor and I have discussed this alteration and the importance of it uh, numerous times. And, it, you know, if we had three, four, 500 meters of it, you'd have a pretty good idea of the bullseye that we're looking at. The fact is now we have 1,700 meters of, of alteration to dig into. Um, and it hasn't stopped. It only stopped because we stopped drilling. Now, the other issue that we have is, is, is people are really waiting for our drill results. Uh, we should have them pretty quickly now. Um, it, the, the labs were dealing with an influx of volume. Um, we knew that was going to happen. Anybody paying attention would have known that the capital that had flowed in to the space and into the basin was, was pretty high and there was a lot of drilling going on and there were staffing issues to begin with um, and those staffing issues have manifested themselves in delays. So, you know, every day I've, I'm dealing with people who are telling us that we're the idiots of the world and, and um, that, you know, it's our fault that the labs are slow and, and uh, every other thing. And the reality is we're, we're just kind of moving along here, waiting for it all to come in. And, and uh, But look, it's the end of June. Um, July and August go by and suddenly we're, we're talking Hatchet Lake at drill program. So we're really not that far off from getting back on the ground. Yeah, you're not alone complaining about lab turnover times, uh, you know, any commodity, most places in the world. So uh, what, what is the turnover time? What are you seeing? Trevor, you, you, you got the 103 day stat there for you? <laughs> we're, we're looking at 14 plus weeks for the first batches that we sent in. So, I mean, it's, you know, this is normally a six to eight week turnaround. We're at 14 weeks, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it is what it is. And there's nothing we can do about that. We can't make things happen. And, and our understanding is that the staffing issue is not at the higher level. It's really at the lower level in, in so far as, you know, they, they need people to, to, to do things with core boxes and, and, and you know, um, that's really where the issue lies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, Warren and Tim, you know, a ALX has been around for quite a while, either as ALX or, or Alpha, um, and, and you guys have had a lot of experience in the sector too. You know, how, how has your approach to exploration changed over the years? Yeah. Well, from my standpoint, I was always looking for things that could be indicators on surface in a kind of a hostile environment for that. Uh, where, where you have featureless sandstone swamps, lakes, um, where's, where do you drill? And if you have a conductor, what's something that tells you that a certain part of that conductor is fertile for uranium? So 20 years ago, I looked at MMI. I managed to twist Cameco's arm to run a survey over Lorac Lake, and they actually saw an anomaly, uh, but it didn't reproduce. So right away, you know, these so-called black box techniques that get downgraded by, by geoscientists, by geochemists. However, if you don't try new things, how can you find that fertile spot? Because you, you could have a kilometer long or 10 kilometers long of conductors and you could drill it till kingdom come and, and you'll find graphite. So how do you find where the uranium is? A cross cutting structure, a soil survey that's telling you there's nanoparticles of uranium above a fertile conductor, um, 
Also, the penetration of airborne surveys has increased remarkably uh, from say VTEM in 2006, you, you might get 200 meters penetration, which is not enough in some cases, it's just not enough to see the basement. So now we have these new techniques like the HeliSAM that I, that I showed a picture of, and those should help us. And, and I will joust with James on, on the, the unicorn comment because I think there's still room to find Bonanza deposits, the MacArthur rivers. If we find them now, yeah, they might sit for 10 or 20 years, but eventually they could be mined and someone will have them in inventory. So I will, I will vote for Bonanza because that's what got me into uranium in the first place. Yeah, certainly. And, and you know, when companies come, like Hathor come around and uh, identify Rough Rider discovery off conductor, that throws another uh, wrench into the game as well. How do you find those things that are off conductor? Uh, and then keep in mind, nobody's looked at off conductor before. So, so right. uh, you know, you, you, you're close to the boundaries of the basin. Are you actually targeting sandstones as opposed to basement posted rocks? You're asking me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. so, sure. I mean, it, it, it can be both. It, obviously, you'd like to find something as shallow as possible. And as we saw in the unconformity model, the basement hosted can be part of that. That's MacArthur River. I mean, what was originally found was was at the unconformity and, and Shea Creek, there's sandstone in, pardon me, uranium in the sandstone, but uh, these structures can have uranium fertility a long way down. So you could have a hybrid, you could have both. The fact is that you have to drill deeper now to make sure you don't miss something. And that's what Cameco proved at Millennium because one time our geologists fell asleep and the drillers kept going, oh my God, we went 120 meters into the unconformity. Oh my goodness. And they said, oh, that's okay. Because they hadn't told anyone about millennium yet. Yeah, understood, understood. Okay, well, uh, I want to thank everybody for having a great discussion. Uh, after this, our final session of the day is our fireside chat. That's with BuySide Investors, L2 Capital, Satcham Cove Partners, and Tribeca Investment. That's coming up at five o'clock today. So I will see you soon. Thank you for joining me, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it, Dave. Thanks, Thanks to all you guys as well. Thank you.